Aircraft have evolved from a lightweight wooden structure with a thin canvas covering through to what we see nowadays, a big modern metal jet with even some composite materials thrown in for good measure. But what do we really need to think about when designing an airframe? Let's find out. Hi, I'm Grant and welcome to the 11th class in the AGK series. Today, we're going to be moving on from the big chunky subjects of engines and electrics and move on to all the other systems on board an aircraft, starting with the most fundamental one, the structure itself or the airframe. The first thing we need to do with an aircraft is get the parts of it named correctly. For this class, we're going to focus and throughout the rest of the AGK series in general, we're going to focus on the A320 series of aircraft. They're very common, they're everywhere and uh, it's about as simple as you can get for a big jet. There's only two engines, basically, is what I'm saying. Your aircraft that you end up flying might have slightly different components and naming conventions, but this will give you a lot of the common ones. So starting things off on the left, we've got the fuselage. That's basically the main bit where all the passengers and bags and uh, staff move around in. You've got engines. Uh, one is on the aircraft left, two is on the aircraft right. You've got the wings, the wing root is the bit closest to the fuselage, wing tips the bit further away. On the wings you have the flight controls which are the ailerons, that helps you bank the aircraft left and right. You've got slats and flaps, there'd be a different combination depending on the aircraft you're in and that uh, provides extra lift which allows you to fly slower for landing and takeoff. Then at the back, you've got the tail assembly, which is sometimes called the empennage. I say sometimes, but I've never heard anybody call it the empennage. They always just call it the tail assembly. You've got the fin, which is the vertical bit, and the rudder, which controls yaw. So that's sort of this motion. And then you've got the tail plane and the elevator, and the elevator controls this motion. So you've got ailerons for roll, you've got rudder for yaw, and you've got elevator for pitch. The fuselage is the big bit where we carry the passengers, cargo and crew. And in the earliest planes, this was just a wooden structure made up of lots of beams and wires to hold the structure in tension. As better lightweight and more reliable materials like steel became available, then the design switched over from a wooden frame to a metal one. This had another advantage of being able to form curves easily which meant that a circular cross section could be formed easily for the fuselage, which is a very strong shape for a pressurized high altitude aircraft. Basically, there's no weak points because the pressure is distributed throughout the whole circle uh, easily. So it pushes on each part of the circle with the same amount of force. We'll cover pressurization in a little bit and in more detail in a couple classes time. Essentially though, a pressurized aircraft holds the internal pressure of aircraft at a high enough level that allows humans to survive easily without the need for additional systems like oxygen masks, which makes it the desired design. You wouldn't want to fly across the Atlantic having to wear an oxygen mask the whole time, for example. The problem with a completely circular fuselage is that there's a lot of dead space where people can't sit unless they have a semi-circular spine or something. So modern aircraft will have a slight circular design, but not fully. The shape will be carefully designed and will change over the lengths of the fuselage for aerodynamic benefits. You want a somewhat pointy nose, for example. And this 3D shape is achieved by fully solid cross sections, which are known as bulkheads. You probably have one right at the very nose and right at the very tail of the aircraft. And there's also things called formers, ribs, struts, stringers, cross beams, longerons, and a whole load of other very technical names for different parts of a framework. This frame then has a skin of another material covering it, which forms the outer layer, keeping the elements off. And this outer layer is normally a thin metal, uh, usually aluminium. Modern aircraft are what we call reinforced shell fuselages, which means that the structure of the fuselage is formed mainly out of the skin, usually aluminium, as I said, or another lightweight metal, and that skin shape is defined by the ribs, bulkheads, and other frame elements in general. And in certain locations around windows and doors, the structure is uh, reinforced with a smaller frame so that the skin of the aircraft isn't weakened too much. In the first aircraft design, the 
skin basically did all the work in holding the structure of the aircraft together in what you would call a monocoque design. Essentially one structural piece. But if it was compromised in one section, then the strength of the whole aircraft was compromised. Then they developed semi-monocoque designs with a frame and a skin, but then they realized that the skin became significantly weaker around the holes that were cutting it for windows and doors, unless they added supporting structure, which is why we now have the modern reinforced shell structures with the additional frames around the windows and doors. The wings of a modern aircraft are self-supporting and don't require wires or supporting structures. It is formed using the same principle as the fuselage. A frame is formed with spars that go from the root closest to the fuselage to the tip. And in between these spars are ribs which provide the shape of an aerofoil that provides lift. A metal skin is then stretched over this frame and internal cavities are formed where the fuel can be stored in uh, specially shaped tanks. It's also important to note that wings are not designed to be super stiff. Flex in the wings allows for turbulence to be smoothed out. They act like giant springs in a way. The flexibility of the wing also serves as a shock absorber for all the forces acting on it. If they weren't flexible, then any force would transfer through the whole wing structure more easily and potentially cause cracks and damage to the wing. So when you're looking out the window of the aircraft and the wing is moving up and down, just think of it like the suspension on a car. The main forces acting on the wing are actually bending loads that come from the weight of the fuselage pulling down at the root, fighting against the lift pulling the wing up. This is part of the reason we store fuel in the wings. It pushes the wing back down again. Therefore, the root of the wing feels less of a force on it. This is where a certain weight limitation comes from, known as the maximum zero fuel mass. To fly, lift and weight must be balanced, and if the weight is all concentrated in the fuselage and none of it is spread out and distributed in the wings, then the lift produced pushes up the wing and causes stress on the joint of the wing to the fuselage. If we go beyond a certain weight without any fuel in the wings, then this can cause damage. So we must make sure that we are below this weight limit before adding fuel in case we burn all the fuel located in the wings. And if an aircraft has additional fuel tanks, they're usually stored under the fuselage in belly tanks. And the fuel in those tanks would be used first to help with the um, process of the, well, help reduce the wing bending moment. Wings can be mounted low, mid, or high up on the fuselage. High mounted wings are usually used in propeller aircraft. You might see this on something like a Dash 8. And this provides good ground clearance for the engines that are mounted on the wings. And with the correct length of landing gear, it can also mean that the fuselage is very close to the ground. For cargo aircraft that have a ramp at the back, this allows vehicles on and off very easily. Low mounted wings are very common in commercial jet aircraft because the strengthening structure can be fixed, the strengthening structure for the wings um, can be fixed underneath the fuselage, meaning more space is available for passengers and bags. The jet engines don't need as much ground clearance as propellers, so shorter landing gear can also be attached, which saves on weight while keeping the fuselage a reasonable distance off the ground. Mid-mounted wings are only really common in fighter jets. Uh, so I guess this aircraft I've drawn is a fighter jet because I've drawn the wing about halfway up. And that's basically because the internal strengthening structure to keep the wings attached to the fuselage takes up space in the fuselage. And fighter jets don't really need that space, so it can go in there fine. Whereas a jet aircraft, you'd have this, you know, big beams poking through the middle of the fuselage, which isn't very good. The tail assembly provides two main functions, stability and control in pitch and stability and control in yaw. I have classes in the Principles of Flight series explaining this in more detail if you want to go and have a look at them. And yes, there is annoying background music, but I can't remove it, so unfortunately, you will just have to put up with it if you're interested. The tail assembly, or empennage, is generally constructed of two parts, the vertical fin and the horizontal tail plane. The fin provides the yaw stability and has the rudder attached to it con to control the yaw and the horizontal tail plane provides the stability in pitch and it has the elevator attached to it to control the pitch. They are constructed in the same way as the wings. They have a frame consisting of spars and ribs with a metal skin stretched over the top. 
The spars generally provide the strength and the ribs generally provide the shape, but there is a bit of crossover between the two. The tailplane is generally mid-mounted in terms of where it is on the fuselage, and this is good for stall characteristics, which to understand it best is to think about the high-mounted T-tail design. If you imagine this tailplane was located up at the top across here. Basically what happens is at high angles of attack or a stall condition, the air that is separating from the wings washes over the T-tail assembly, meaning that the tail assembly has, or the tail plane rather, has disturbed air flowing over it. And this disturbed air is much harder to generate an aerodynamic force from. And in a stall situation, the only way to resolve a stall is to lower the nose using the elevator at the tail to provide this pitching down force. If the tail has a reduced ability to do this because of the disturbed airflow over it, then it can lead to a very tricky stall to get out of called a deep stall. However, you will still see T tails out there. Why is this? Well, the mid mounted tails are affected by the airflow coming off the back of the wings in normal flight. The wings basically force the air to flow down the way after it passes over it in a phenomenon called downwash. This downwash changes the direction of the relative airflow over the tail plane. See, it normally comes in at this angle, but the downwash pulls it down, which reduces the angle of attack between the cord line of the tail plane and the relative airflow, which is the angle of attack. The lower the angle of attack, then the lower the aerodynamic force produced, and if that sounds confusing, then I would again recommend looking at some of the principles of flight videos that I have. The essence of what I'm saying though, is that a mid-mounted tailplane will produce less aerodynamic forces because the wings ahead of it are disturbing the airflow, but this is more desirable than the disturbed airflow of a stall situation and a T-tail. And because of these stall characteristics, a T-tail is much less common and a mid-mounted tail can be calculated for and accounted for, and this uh, reduced aerodynamic force can be uh, designed around, if that makes sense. You can design the tailplane to be bigger or um, uh, sit slightly outside the downwash. You also get combined tailplanes and fins in what is known as a V-tail, and the rudder and the elevator are also combined into very cool sounding rudder vators. They aren't all that common though, and you only really see them on smaller aircraft. The doors of an aircraft are obviously a very important part of the plane. We need to get in and out of the thing. They're also just a massive hole in the side of the fuselage, so it can be a weakness unless designed properly. On a big pressurized jet aircraft, the doors are often called a plug door. These doors have a slight wedge shape to them and open internally before then being pushed back out and opened up. What this means is that as the pressure on the outside of the aircraft drops, and the pressure on the inside of the aircraft remains higher, the door is forced out of the way and locks into place because of this wedge shape. And this makes it very difficult to open these doors in flight or when the aircraft is pressurized. This means that the locking mechanism for the door doesn't really need to be too strong as the pressurization of the aircraft keeps the door shut. If an aircraft doesn't have an inward opening plug door, then the locking mechanism needs to be a lot stronger to hold back the pressure from the inside of the cabin pushing out. And it's often achieved through what you'd expect, big heavy locking bolts. These type of doors are also good for cargo doors as the door doesn't need to be opened in the way first. This way we can fill cargo all the way up to the edge and just close the door like the top of a box. Some aircraft will also have power assisted doors where springs and counterbalancing weights help the doors to open and close. That's what we have on the A320, for example. Electric and hydraulic assistant is also common for cargo doors. You get doors with steps built onto them on small aircraft. Essentially, there's lots of kinds of doors and hatches and entryways for all different types of aircraft. There are holes in the side of the aircraft structure though. So as I said, in the fuselage section, they need to be strong and surrounded by strong frames to provide extra support to that area, especially in pressurized aircraft. So to summarize then, the aircraft is basically constructed the same way throughout. There's just different names for the components. You might have the uh, bulkhead part of the frame, which is basically a solid 
a, a disc or a solid other 2D shape, maybe at the nose and the tail, most likely at the nose and the tail. And then throughout the aircraft, you'll have ribs, longerons, uh, whatever, spars and other framework components, which then have a lightweight skin stretched over them. It's the same concept for the wings. You've got uh, spars that run the length and then you've got the ribs inside which form the shape. Same for the tail assembly. And uh, it's basically a frame with a skin stretched over it. It's, it's all designed roughly the same. The only thing we need to think about is the holes in the side of the aircraft, the doors and the windows. We want to add a bit more framework into the structure. Uh, so we're not doing a monocoque or a semi-monocoque design. We're doing a reinforced shell structure design uh, to make sure those windows and doors are very strong and not weak points of our plane. The wings and the tail can be high mounted, low mounted or mid mounted. You'll generally see low mounted wings on jet aircraft, high mounted wings on propeller aircraft and mid for uh, fighter jets and things like that. The low wing mounting allows for the supporting structure to be located under the fuselage which keeps the fuselage free for passengers and bags uh, with a propeller and a high wing setup. The reason it's high is to provide extra ground clearance for the spinning propellers um, and if you have nice short legs of the, uh, you know what I mean, legs, landing gear, that's the word, uh, that means that the fuselage can be very close to the ground which is good for cargo aircraft. If you think about a ramp dropping off the back of a high up aircraft, it would have to drop down quite a lot. Whereas if you've got a small, uh, uh, close to the ground fuselage, it only has to drop a little bit. Same process for the tails, it can be mid, high or low mounted. Generally mid is better for jet aircraft as that's where the stalling characteristics are most favorable. Doors, plug type, pushes back out because of the pressurization, seals it shut with the pressurization, or you can get other types which aren't plug type doors, they just need a bit of uh, a more robust locking system.